Good morning and happy Tuesday. Welcome to Thoughts and Coffee. We finally got it working on my personal LinkedIn page. I can see it over here. That's super exciting. We've got a lot of major announcements that have happened. There's so many exciting things happening at Let's Talk Supply Chain. And as you can see, I am in a little bit of a different spot in the house because my house is completely in disarray while I am recording the LinkedIn live course that's gonna be coming out this fall. So we are right in the middle of filming. The set is over there. Um, and so I am in a different spot of the house, but super excited to come at you live. Audrey is joining me today from my basement because she's been helping me with all of this recording. And uh, I can't wait for her to come up at, or come up, I guess, come on the screen from downstairs in my basement. We're in the same house. It's kind of a crazy day but I love it. Anyways, anyways, I hope you guys are having a great week. So let's talk about what is happening on Let's Talk Supply Chain this week. I guess I should probably introduce myself too. So my name is Sarah Barnes Humphrey, founder and host of Let's Talk Supply Chain podcast media company. I'm also the host of Blended, which is the newest conversation in diversity and inclusion. Go and check that out because it is our newest podcast. It's called Blended. And uh, yeah, so let's talk about what's happening on Let's Talk Supply Chain this week. So drum roll, please. We just literally launched. We just dropped this huge announcement that we are franchising Let's Talk Supply Chain into Asia Pack. This is going to be hosted. It's going to be a podcast. Um, we're also talking about live shows. Um, but this is going to be hosted by Jonathan over in Sydney, Australia. And he's going to be talking to experts over in Asia Pack about supply chain over there. What is happening? What's new? What solutions are out there? And I cannot wait for this to get started. So this was a huge, huge announcement. And we also dropped the episode yesterday. So Jonathan and I jumped on a podcast episode to talk all about what's what you can expect from this new podcast and from the franchise. And uh, so go and check that out over on letstalksupplychain.com forward slash podcast or wherever you subscribe to the show. So on Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you subscribe, it will be there. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it because we are super excited over here. What else is happening? So we also want to be talking about our upcoming events. So this is today at noon. I am moderating three sessions, one with Glenn of Four Kites, Evan of Best Buy, and Andrew of Infosys talking about retail supply chain visibility. So if you're not signed up yet, go to our Let's Talk Supply Chain LinkedIn page and register for these events. This one is coming up at noon today. Then we've got Coupa. So this one is happening tomorrow. So I'm going to be moderating a session for Coupa in partnership with the with MIT. And we're going to be talking about building supply chain resilience, lessons from disaster response. So hopefully we can see you there. AJ, can you actually post the link to this LinkedIn post so everybody can um, check out the registration? pages for those. And then of course, we've got manifest coming up in January as well. The other thing that I want to talk to you about, which is super, super exciting. Last week, we dropped the first episode of coming in hot with Abby Baird. This is one of our newest live shows. And we've got about five coming out between now and the end of August, which I'm super excited about. And we'll let you know as we get closer, Abby's going to do one show a month. It's the last Thursday of every month. And this is going to be talking about what's happening in supply chain, but more importantly, how to get into supply chain, what you need to know, how you need to network, because Abby is a student over at the University of Arkansas studying supply chain. And so we want to inspire the next generation um, and talk a little bit about what you need to know and so, so much more. So I was her first guest. And if you want to go and check that out, it's over on the Let's Talk Supply Chain LinkedIn page as well. So I think that's that's it for now. Let's bring Audrey Ross up to the stage. 
Good morning, Audrey, all the way from my basement. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, 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 good. Why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll dive right in because we've got a lot, a lot. We've got a lot today. Uh, so I'm Audrey Ross. I'm a logistics and customs specialist based in Toronto uh, here in Canada. I work for an award-winning business-to-business private labeling company called Orchard Custom Beauty. Um, and I ship globally into about 16 different countries back and forth, sometimes around. Sometimes we don't ship at all because it's really hard. Um, but that's where I'm at this week. <laughs> okay, you just said that. Can you just remind me how much yeah. you were quoted yesterday? Because I think the oh sure, know. yeah. So I'm trying to get a full container, just a one by forty, not even a forty-five, not even a high cube, just one by forty, and it's where I just hit what twenty-two thousand five hundred. So yeah, what? So yeah. we were talking about, or in Clubhouse a couple weeks ago, we were talking about yeah. it potentially going up to 35,000. No. But the fact that it's at 22,000 right now, like I thought that was a bit of a stretch, but you're at 22,000 right now. And I'm just like. It's happening. Oh. I went from 14.5 a couple of weeks ago. Then it was 17. Then now it's like, oh, if you want to pay the premium so that you get on this boat, which you'd never get on the boat, um, then it's 22.5. And I was like, you know what? I'm. I'm, uh, I don't want to tell everybody my secrets, but I'm literally splitting stuff into LCL and just like doing multiple split shipments. Davin, Davin asks if that is USD. Of course it's USD. What, we, in shipping, we all talk USD. We don't, if it was Canadian, it'd be like a hundred thousand Canadian. <laughs> Stop it. No. You'd be buying your own boat at that point to move. If, yeah, boat. it was, it'd be, it, it, that's about, it's about 28 to 30,000 Canadian right now. So it's, it's not, it's not fun. Crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. So I just want to yeah. say hi to everybody over on my personal LinkedIn page. We've got Anindia. We've got Christian. We've got Hope White. What? what? Oh, so excited that you're here. We've got Samuel from Panama. Davin was over on my personal. Now he's yeah. over on the Let's Talk supply chain. That's yeah. why we can see him up on the screen. And Larry Lung is over there as well. There. So, Davin says, well, I figured I figured it was USD, but I was being hopelessly optimistic. <laughs> love <that. laughs> you love your optimism there, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, what are we talking about today? So, um, so we what? have to do thoughts, thoughts and coffee and no, the question. It's a poll. Yeah. yeah. Oh, AJ, what's the poll question? I don't yeah. even know what the poll question is today. <laughs> I think he sent it to me. Hold on one yeah. moment. Let me check my phone because he did send it to me. Yeah. And I am just behind because I'm totally not. Okay. So mm -hmm. the poll question that was, okay. So every single Wednesday on our cross yeah. social media, we ask a question of the week. And yeah. this week is our poll. So the question is, what's the earliest time you'll attend a meeting? And comment mm -hmm. not listed. So he's got 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., and 9 a.m. Yeah, I've I've run a webinar at 7 a.m. because it was in Europe. Europe. That's the earliest that I will go. I've asked, I've been asked for 3 a.m. Eastern. Not happening, people. I need my eight hours sleep. I'm sorry. <laughs> and maybe I'm letting the cat out of the bag here, but I definitely need eight hours sleep. What yeah. about you? 4:30 a.m. UK webinar. What? You yeah. actually said yes to that? A cu customer. I didn't have much of a choice. Oh, every once in a while, every once in a while, depending on what it is. But this was like a group one. It was like every, you know, all of our vendors. So you're like, well, I can't be the one out of 100 vendors who's like, hmm, Canada time. Um, <laughs> so Dad so but most of the time, if it's like, if it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting, then no. I'll say like, um, just so you know, I'm in Canada. Because it's hard. Because we're very global. Right. So people That's assume... True. People assume that I'm in China. People assume that I'm in Europe. People assume that I'm in South Africa. And you're like, actually, I'm in Canada. So if we could a little closer to Eastern time, that'd be amazing. So. And I think we need to all go after Starbucks to see if I can get Starbucks as a, a, little sponsor, as a, a yeah. author for thoughts and coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so Abby Shack says, can we talk about contract management? We would love to talk about contract management. If you can find a good article about contract management, yes, send, send it to me and we will talk about it on an upcoming episode because I would love that. So thank yeah. you so much for, for sharing that. And so the question of the week will be posted tomorrow morning. It's gonna be in a poll. 
Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't do meetings before 9 a.m. usually. Yeah. But that's just me. It's I like that like sweet spot, that 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 3 p.m. You know, you're like, that's perfect. 1 p.m. meeting. You're like, that's great. Peter says he took a call at midnight. That's crazy. Yeah, man. I've done that. Well, China, if you're doing China. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's true. Yeah. And I mean, in supply chain, we're kind of up at all hours anyways. Yeah. All right. So our thoughts and coffee posts. Let's talk about this. So on Friday, and this is I'm totally detouring from the thoughts and coffee posts that I usually do on a Sunday. Yeah. That post, I talked about multiculturalism day in Canada. Yeah. And but I thought this one was a little bit more interesting for what we're talking about today. So I posted a video on my personal LinkedIn uh, tour of the mega container ship. And so this mm. is from a seafarer standpoint. So seafarer went through the ship and really gave us an in-depth view within eight minutes of what a container ship actually looks like. I got a ton of feedback on this because people really love to see what a working <laughs> vessel actually looked like from a seafarer standpoint as well. So um, really, really liked this post, wanted to share it with you guys in case you wanna go and see the video. Again, you can go and check it out under posts on my LinkedIn page. Uh, what did you think about this, Audrey? I just love it. I had a professor um, when I took my college courses who had gone and try and done, ridden on a freighter I think from India into the Caribbean, like a bulk rice freighter. And he was like, I did it so you don't have to. He was like, I was so curious and wanted to do it. And I talked them into letting me go on board. And he was like, he was like, it was not comfortable. It was not pleasant. He was like, you know, so it, it's, it's interesting to see what's inside. And like the fact that seafarers, you know, they're, they're on these vessels for months and months at a time. And, and we know through COVID they've been on these um, sort of enforced extended contracts. So it's interesting to see what the space is like, what the, you know, because we only usually see the vessels from, you know, the, the, the sort of large side view or when they're sitting at the port. So I'm going to copy the link and I'm going to put it into the comments for everybody. Because yeah. Bali says that it is a very, very good one. So yeah. there we go. I have put it in the comments so you guys can go and check it out, yeah. except for it's having trouble connecting. It was, um, and it's, it was International Day of the Seafarer on June 25th. So that was Friday, um, Friday, June 25th was International Day of the Seafarer. So, um, if you haven't, like you've signed the Neptune Declaration. So if you haven't, have a look into that and, yes. um, yeah. Go and check that out as well. All right. We've also got a really quick article before we yeah. move on to our supply chain article. I wanted to show this to you because everybody knows I like the hustle, but they're saying that the flying cars are coming. Hmm. So what do you think about this? I mean, we've already got apparently Joby, the Metro Air Taxi. They are testing an electric air taxi that fits one pilot and four passengers. Yeah. Black Fly, the single passenger vehicle, and the autonomous air taxi by Kitty Hawk. So would you actually get in one of these? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, we haven't even figured out autonomous vehicles yet. Yeah. So I'm a little concerned about putting those autonomous vehicles in the air, but I don't know. And this is going to change the supply chain forever. I mean, think about these, <laughs> think about this Metro air taxi as an Uber. Yeah. Right. Because you can put product in there, you can get it delivered yeah. to somebody's house and it's flying through the air. So forget drones. We're going to be yeah. talking about passenger vehicles and airborne uber taxis potentially <laughs> delivering product people but i'm i'm with rhonda though because you know and driving up here like people can't drive already <laughs> so i'm almost for the autumn the autonomous vehicles because you're like they are controlled and no one's like distracted or is like if you just moved over you know you could just pull a little tighter to the right and get by that person to make the right turn i don't know why you're waiting um <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't have to do that if you were in the air, I don't think. And I don't so know. Are we going to have think... to go through new testing? Well, for sure. Well, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to go through new testing for sure. But I think, I don't know. I think the autonomous vehicles, I think we're very frightened of it. But I think if you can operate it, you know, in a proper grid and it follows regulations that, you know. I'm like, really? Like humans are better drivers than an autonomous vehicle? Okay. I don't know, but... but a grid up in the air? Like, how is that? We don't, we don't I have know. roads. I mean, how I know. people are going to be all over the place. It's fifth element, right? Like the Harry like... Potter 
I don't think. <laughs> well, I don't think we let like fourteen-year-old children drive the car. That's sort of the, <laughs> the okay. point. All right, got it. Got it. You know, All right. like if you were a former F one driver, now you can apply for your your license. Um, but Kitty Hawk has the best name. That's a great name for. for I really like that name. Anyways, I just wanted to share it with you because <laughs> the future it's of coming. air taxis and Uber drivers <laughs> apparently are just around the corner people. And so I thought that was a very important announcement to make on Fox yes. & Coffee this morning. All right, <laughs> let's talk about our first supply chain article. So have you guys mm. heard of Ikea hacking? And you might be wondering, well, what the hell does this have to do with supply chain? Well, it's got everything to do with supply chain, not only from a sustainability perspective, but also from the fact that it could be potentially the answer to our shortages, mm -hmm. right? And the supply and demand mm -hmm. and how much we're paying for containers. So let's talk about this a little bit. The question that I have for you is how much Ikea do you have in your house? Because in this article, it says 50% of the population in Sweden owns at least one piece of Ikea furniture. So let's talk about this. What did you think of this article and how it pertains to supply chain? I love it because yeah, it does address it does address the sustainability piece of um, and there's a couple of polls and questions that were asked, um, you know, on would you choose um, is sustainable furniture important to you? Would you choose that? Um, and it also addresses some of the stats around um, repurposing, right? Instead of buying new, um, so those are all important, um, you know. But it's uh, the other piece that's great is yeah, like when when you're in a furniture shortage like we are now. I think I said to someone, I was like, um, I was talking to somebody, I was like, oh, if you have you know an old piece of furniture, hack it up and make it into a new piece of furniture because there's such a shortage right now to get anything that you know you could start repurposing or you know reselling you know your old furniture. So yeah. it's uh, it's coming. It's depending true. on it's true happens. i just want to also say hi to andrew over on my personal linkedin as well thank <laughs> you guys all so much for joining so my thoughts on this is <laughs> the first thing that came to mind was 3d printing mm -hmm. yeah because if we're repurposing ikea furniture and we're using things like changing the legs or yeah. changing the um the knobs right yeah. like on a cabinet or something like that then we get into things that we could potentially easily um, make using a 3D printer, which will then change supply chain and what we're bringing in. Because at that point, then we're bringing in raw materials versus finished goods, potentially. Right. So that was the first thing that came to mind when I was reading this article. And I'm just I'm showing you some of the stats of this article. I really urge you to go and read this yeah. because it's a very long article, not very long article, but it's a long well, article, but it goes through some stats and some of the things that you can do and what people are thinking, right? They're thinking about sustainability. And one of the things, one of the other reasons why I like this article is obviously sustainability, right? So it's repurposing, but we're also getting into personalization. And yeah. so we've been talking about the effect of personalization on supply chain, because yeah. with personalization, you aren't buying in bulk, you aren't moving things in bulk. And so that's bringing the manufacturing back locally, or you're using a 3D printer to do that, or you are doing it overseas with a longer lead time. But what they're also talking about is how Ikea has turned their furniture into fast furniture. And we talk mm -hmm. about fast fashion, how bad fast fashion is for the environment. Well, yeah. so, is, so is fast furniture. Apparently 20 million tons of uh, furniture was dumped, I think, before 2010. And in the yeah. last 10 years, it has doubled. Yeah. And so this is this is becoming a really, really important issue and something that we need to think about when we're looking to actually get rid of furniture. Can it be repurposed? But the other thing I liked about this is that it might be the answer to our shortage, shortage yeah. issue, right? <laughs> Because we all know that I waited for my, my couch last year. I bought it in July and I didn't get it delivered to December. But if I had maybe repurposed the couch that I already had, I wouldn't have had that issue and I might have had a brand new couch within a couple of months, right? Because I would have been able to find potentially the things that I needed to, to repurpose it. Mm 
The other right. thing that I'm going to mention is that IKEA uses 1% of the world's entire wood supply. So think about that right now, because lumber, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, the prices are going up exponentially yeah. and they use 1% of the world's supply, which is crazy. So the stats in this article are amazing. And that's yeah. one of the reasons why I wanted to share it with you, because it has a, a supply chain component, has a sustainability component, but it also makes you think about the furniture that you have in the house. And I think what IKEA has done well, like your sort of first point about being able to do 3D printing um, is like IKEA uses universal designs. So the hardware and measurements are uniform across, um, you know, across most of the developed world. So every, almost every country, like you can, you could re, you know, you could 3D print this because everyone's going to understand their measurements and technical drawings. And like, they're very organized on that. So I think it's a, a good example for, smaller businesses or medium businesses who are like, how can I kind of maximize instead of shipping everything? Um, if you come to some sort of standardization and really understand the measurements and metrics that are in play in whatever market they're shipping to um, mm -hmm. and trying to get to, to be more uniform, um, you know, I think that's, that'll help you um, when we do get into these technologies, because, you know, you do run into issues where it's like, is this inches? Is this centimeters? Is this European pallets? Is this standard pallets? So, Anywhere, um, I'm a big fan of standardization. So anywhere where like IKEA is kind of a good example of this that you can use it, that's probably good. I love that. I want to say hi to Elias um, over on my personal hello. LinkedIn. He says hello from Kenya and Debbie is over there as well. So good morning to you. All right. So our next article comes from yeah. Eric Johnson. So Eric Johnson, I have said this before, he's going to have a live show with us. I'm pretty sure it's going to start in July. So look out for the announcements for that. It's going to be great because it's going to be a, an extension of the blog that he writes. And he writes a great blog every single week. This particular blog itself was written by TNX Logistics, I think. No, who, who wrote this one? Yeah. Jonah McIntyre, the CEO of TNX Logistics. So everyone's still want to have a, have a our friend Brian is a guest and now he's got uh, Jonah McIntyre. Yeah. So the question that I have for you guys is, are we advancing and, mm -hmm. in technology or who do you think will pull out ahead? Because this particular article talks about how we've got technological advancements in, mm -hmm. well, he's talking more about trucking, trucking right now, but we've got a lot of technological advancements. We've got a lot of money being poured into the industry right now. Right. And but what he's saying is that we we don't have tech giants like an Elon Musk in supply yeah. chain, right? Yeah. We, and they're and the companies that are getting huge investments, they don't have huge market share. They mm -hmm. still only have small portions of the market. Yeah. And what's happening is that they're continuing to bank on reduced prices, right? Sustaining losses or acquiring other companies. And so right now the competitive advantage for all the tech companies in supply chain is capital. It's not actually the technology advancements that we need in the industry. So how are we gonna get differentiation in technology and who do you think is gonna pull ahead? He actually mentioned a few people, like I think it was XPO and Convoy, yeah. but we're still not there yet. So who do you think is going to pull out ahead? What did you think of this article, Audrey? I loved it because it really, you know, Eric had asked a good question um, about does this onset of logistics tech create massive winners or does it just improve everyone? And and so Jonah's kind of, um, you know, lead here is that, yeah, I mean, we've seen improvements overall to the market, like the trucks are more efficient. It's a yeah. better environment for the drivers. You know, we have more visibility, but everybody has that. No one's really pulled out ahead. No one's really taken an edge lead. And like, we, I think because we're surrounded too by things like Apple and Samsung and, you know, this uh, SpaceX, it's like, you kind of see these, you see these like big winners or these sort of, this is the thing you know, that everyone's kind of aspiring to. And in transportation and, and in supply chain, we haven't, we see a lot of technology, a lot of different technology and, but a ton of companies and no one's a real clear winner, you know, kind of winner, which, you know, I mean, if you think about a business that is collaborative and, you know, um, 
you know, then maybe that kind of competitive piece and getting ahead isn't as valuable, but you know, it's very interesting. So true. So Alex and Debbie, you're asking for the articles over on my personal LinkedIn. I am going to share them after the show. So I will definitely tag you guys when I do that. Going back to the IKEA, and India says maybe they should, maybe IKEA should think towards mobile homes. And mm. Peter says it's hard enough to put the bed together. Could you imagine an instruction <laughs> manual? I wonder if they would provide the tools. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I I just think back to how long it took me to put together one of their closets. I could not imagine it, it would take me like six months. No, but that's a whole together. subsection of their business. <laughs> IKEA IKEA is like you have startups who just put together their furniture for you. Like that's a whole other subsection of the IKEA. Yeah, world. but sometimes you just want to try it yourself. And oh, I sure. think the closet took me eight hours and four people. <laughs> so a mobile home? Eh, six months. Who knows? You know, six anyway, people, last three article. months. Peter, Peter is about to give me the five minute warning. Oh my gosh. All right. So last article, why is lumber so expensive right now? <laughs> the question I have for you right now is what shortages are you seeing? Because I think we're yeah. seeing all sorts of different shortages all across Random. the world. And the title of this episode is Bizarre Shortages. And so in 2020 to 2021, we've seen shortages in boba tea, which we've talked about on the show, chicken wings, toilet paper. Well, everybody knows the toilet paper not scandal. I was going to say scandal. Okay. Scandal. Scandal. Uh, bidets. <laughs> Apparently, that's a shortage thing. Okay. Yeah. Because everybody wants one now. Rental yeah. cars. Okay. Yeah. Rental, rental cars are crazy. Car. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I saw someone that. they had to pay like $2,000 for one day. What? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to send you some stuff on rental You're cars. You're going to have to send me stuff. Okay. Yeah. But then garden gnomes. So, which what? is that a bad thing? Well, okay. So, my cousin over in the UK, they had a garden gnome actually stolen out of their garden the other day, and I thought that was a little bit strange. Like, why are you stealing? But now I understand with the shortages in garden gnomes. I mean, where else are you going to get one? I guess. I mean, but yeah. please don't steal other people's garden gnomes. Yeah. Just because there's a shortage. But the yeah. real issue here is the lumber. Well. So this particular, um, and if Jeff Carter from LinkedIn is watching, this article is for you because you asked us about the lumber. And so I went and found an article for you. <laughs> so this actually goes through the timeline yeah. of the lumber and why it's sky high. And so over the past year, the price of lumber in the US shot up as much as 377%. Yeah. It used to go for two to three hundred dollars per a thousand feet. Now it's at seventeen hundred dollars, which is crazy. But what that means is rentals increase by one hundred and nineteen dollars a month and house prices go up by thirty six thousand dollars as well because of the lumber shortage. And what I'm about to tell you, I mean, we talked about this just a couple of minutes ago. If IKEA is taking up one percent of the world's entire lumber supply, I mean, we need to knock on their doors and ask them to share a little bit. But anyways, um, part of the issue is, and I'm going through all of this because it goes through this like huge timeline Little, yeah. of love. And I would highly recommend going to see this. But the reason for the shortages or some of the reasons is because Canada had a couple of issues. In the early 2000s, we had an infestation of bark eating beetles and they actually pillaged 44 me meters. Million acres, million acres, million. million acres. And then we had devastating wildfires as well, which we don't hear very much about in Canada. And a soft with lumber dispute, but they did not mention Yeah, and then in April 2020, they thought that they were going to see shrinking demand because of yeah. the pandemic, but they actually saw that it went up. And so yeah. they had cut back on their output capacity, and that's why we have a lumber shortage. But also... Some of the reasons for that is that they can't build more mills, they can't expand existing mills, and they can't hire fast enough. Yeah. So the one thing I took from this, and we have a minute to go, 45 seconds, is that if you have any pallets or any lumber in your garage, <laughs> in your basement, you are sitting on a gold mine, and you shouldn't keep it to yourself unless you need it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that wraps it up nicely. <laughs> if you have if you have grandma's furniture in the basement, hack it up, add some IKEA pieces, and sell it. <laughs> so what did we learn today? 
<laughs> repurpose your IKEA furniture. Yeah. We need some more tech moguls in supply chain to really drive this industry forward. Yeah. And lastly, if you have any sort of lumber anywhere near your house, you're sitting on a gold mine and yeah. you need to share it or sell it. <laughs> Anyways, we are at 10.30. Thank you guys once again for joining us for Thoughts and Coffee. I will be back next week. And of course, I don't remember who my guest is. <laughs> and um, yeah, we'll see you at 10 a.m. next Tuesday. I hope you guys have an amazing rest of the day. And don't worry, everybody, on my personal LinkedIn, I'm going to share the articles right now. Thanks so much, Audrey. Have a great week, everybody.